Good afternoon. My name is Adriana Link, and I am the head of scholarly programs here at the American Philosophical Society. Welcome to today's virtual book launch for the edited volume, Indigenous Languages and the Promise of Archives, now available in hardcover and paperback from the University of Nebraska Press. The American Philosophical Society resides in what is now known as Philadelphia, which is in Lenape Hoking, the homeland of the Lenape people, whose relationships and connections with the land continue to this day and into the future. In recognizing this, the society expresses its thanks for the past and ongoing generosity of Lenape, as well as that of numerous other indigenous communities and individuals throughout this continent who have offered guidance, expertise, correction, and opportunities for collaboration. Their generosity makes the work of the Society's Library and Museum possible. For those joining us for the first time, the American Philosophical Society was founded by Benjamin Franklin in 1743. The Society is a catalyst for the discovery of new knowledge. Election to membership honors those who have made exceptionally significant contributions to science, the arts and humanities, and public life. The Society promotes research by providing over a million and a half dollars in research grants a year primarily to younger scholars who need the support the most. Our library and museum collections and research serve scholars and visitors from across the globe. Please check our website, www.amphilsoc.org, to learn more about what we do and for news of forthcoming events. Today's event celebrates the 2021 publication of Indigenous Languages and the Promise of Archives, which is based on the Proceedings of Society's 2016 conference, Translating Across Time and Space, Endangered Languages, Cultural Revitalization, and the Work of History. This conference brought together university and indigenous community-based scholars in multiple areas of expertise, including indigenous language speakers, activists, and teachers from throughout North America. The conference centered on the reclamation, preservation, and strengthening of indigenous languages, both historically and in the present day, as well as practices surrounding translation and translators over the last five centuries, the work of language and cultural revitalization and models for collaboration in all of these areas. We're excited to be able to continue these discussions today with several of the conference participants who expanded on their experiences and shared their expertise in chapters included in the volume. And we'll include throughout the presentation today, uh, links where you can purchase uh, both the hardcover and paperback edition of the volume with a generous 40% discount from the University of Nebraska Press. We're using Zoom webinar for today's discussion, so not to worry, you have all been muted. If you have a question, we ask that you please use the Q&A button at the bottom center of your navigation bar. You can type your question in at any time during today's discussion. There'll be plenty of time at the end of the presentations for questions with our speakers. We're also excited to offer closed captioning for today's virtual discussion. If you would like to use it during the panel, please click on the CC box at the bottom navigation bar of Zoom. It is to the right of the Q&A button. Finally, today's event is sponsored by the American Philosophical Society Center for Native American and Indigenous Research. To tell you more about the center and to introduce today's speakers, I'd like to turn things over to my colleague, Brian Carpenter, Curator of Indigenous Materials at the APS. Uh, thank you, Adriana. Um, I'm pleased to be uh, here with you today. And uh, the center uh, where I work here is the uh, Center for Native American and Indigenous Research. It's a permanent department of the APS Library and Museum. And here we work with indigenous communities from throughout the continent who actually constitute uh, the majority of the requests we receive. And as well with uh, campus and community-based scholars and all sorts of disciplines and traditions. Uh, this senior is really meant to be the uh, main contact point for anyone wanting to engage with the indigenous related collections here at the APS. Um, and uh, one, uh, as part of the uh, work that we do, uh, we uh, digitize materials for free when it is in, in support of community based uh, research and initiatives. Um, we have also created an indigenous subject guide, which is a curated guide to uh, the uh, APS Indigenous Related Collections. There will be a link in the chat, uh, both about senior and about the Indigenous Subject Guide. If you have any questions about that, please do not hesitate to get in touch. We're glad to work with anyone who would like to um, know more about the collections. Um, and with that, um, I would like to move along to introducing today's presenters. Uh, 
Caleb Begay uh, is a member of the Hoopa Valley Tribe and a board member of Advocates for Indigenous California Language Survival, an assistant professor in Native American Studies at Humboldt University. Begay uh, received her PhD in linguistics from the University of California, Berkeley, focusing on the description of California Dene languages and language revitalization. Justin Spence is Assistant Professor of Native American Studies at the University of California, Davis. His research focuses on Native American languages and linguistics, especially Diné languages of California and Oregon, drawing on data from archival sources and original fieldwork with contemporary speech communities. Cheryl Tuttle is a member of the Yurok tribe of Yurok Karak ancestry, an ITEP graduate of Humboldt State University, working in education since 1985, principal of Round Valley Elementary Middle School, and director of Native Studies uh, for the Round Valley Unified School District. She has implemented and taught Wailaki since 2014. And unfortunately, uh, Cheryl can't be with us today. She's a busy teacher doing good work uh, today um, with her students, um, but we'll learn more about her work in the presentation. Uh, Margaret Ann Newton is American with Anishinaabe, Métis, and Irish ancestry. She received an MFA in creative writing and a PhD in linguistics from the University of Minnesota. She is currently a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, where she also serves as Associate Dean of the Humanities and as Director of the Electaquini Institute for American in Indian Education. And finally, Carrie Miller is Anishinaabe and descends from St. Croix and Leech Lake communities. She is Associate Professor in Native Studies at the University of Manitoba, where she serves as department head and teaches courses in Indigenous history and governance. She received her PhD in history from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, and our first presenters will be uh, Kayla and Justin. Um, uh, who will be learning uh, about their work first, and uh, we're glad to have them here with us today. And I think it's just a general lead-in. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, just to start us off, the, uh, as uh, Adriana mentioned, this uh, originates, uh, the, the volume originates from uh, a conference that we held back in 2016, in which um, you both uh, presented uh, on uh, what we'll be telling us more about today. It's been five years, almost six years since then. So one of the questions we would, of course, want to learn about is um, what's happened in the meantime, uh, what's happened since then and where you see it going. And I'll hand it over to you from there. Thank you. Hey, I'm Kayla, um, Kayla begay Foliet. Uh, my name is Kayla Begay. Um, I come from the Acorn Storing Place. Um, and the Hoopa Valley. I'm going to go ahead and, and share my screen at this moment so we can go ahead and get started. And I just want to thank everyone for, for having us here. Um, and I'll hand it over uh, also to, to Justin just really uh, as soon as I get this going and we can get started. Um, so our project, oops, our project uh, and chapter largely focused on our work with Wailaki, which is an Eel River or Athabascan Dene language, a sleeping language, historically spoken um, in the Eel River drainage in Northwest California, uh, including tributaries such as the Van Dusen, the Middle Fork, South Fork, as well as the Upper Mad River of Northwestern California. I have some pictures here of territory, um, including the Eel River, Tang Kyo, Tang Cho, and uh, our work, though, largely focuses on the revitalization of um, Wailaki on the Round Valley Indian Reservation um, in Covalo, California, or Quintes Chobet, uh, which talks about that valley being a wide valley. Uh, from our work in 2016, it's really a snapshot <laughs> of work through the years up to that point where uh, we're working with Round Valley uh, high School and Cheryl Tuttle, who, who can't necessarily be here today um, because she's teaching, and uh, other Wailaki teachers uh, in Round Valley, whereby they are uh, learning and are revitalizing the language from documentation and for use in the classroom. 
And this was starting in 2014, largely from um, projects that both myself and Justin were a part of in the Breath of Life Archival Institute offered by the uh, Advocates for Indigenous California Language Survival. Uh, myself, I worked with a uh, Wailaki woman, uh, Tichetsa Talili, in, in 2012, and um, Justin worked with, uh, with, with Cheryl and um, Rolinda Want, who are high school teachers uh, in Round Valley School District. And, and that was a long time coming. It's something that hadn't previously been offered in the Round Valley School District native language classes. Uh, but what kind of uh, conspired to come together was that uh, documentation became available to us, um, both from a from number of different sources at Berkeley, the APS, as well as materials from uh, Lee Fung Kui from the 1920s. And then also at the Round Valley School District, they had recently at the time gotten a new superintendent that had taught um, in the Hoopa Valley uh, school district where Hoopa, Yurok, and Karuk were offered. And so coming to Round Valley, there was this question, you know, how can we get this, these languages of Round Valley, which there are many, um, there's about seven different tribal groups there. Um, how can we get the, the languages off the ground and, and, and teaching them to students? And so we were brought in as linguistic consultants to various um, Wailaki peoples in the Breath of Life Archival Institute. And we learned very quickly there weren't a lot of um, published materials on Wailaki, though there were documentation. Um, and there's no current first language speakers, nor extensive recordings. So these are really unique conditions, I think, um, in the sense that uh, there hadn't been a, a breath of life language brought into uh, the classroom in this way. And so how are we going to do this? Um, there's a lot of challenges for the revitalization part of it, but also just straight linguistic analysis. And this is a snapshot in the ways we collaborated and approached challenges in interpreting the documentation. And also just that collaboration uh, included a lot of unique skill sets. Myself and um, Justin are, of course, uh, trained linguists. Um, my, I am um, a trainer for ICLS for the Advocates for Indigenous California Language Survival. And then Cheryl, who's not here today, um, is a longtime educator, uh, curriculum builder, and again, um, very good at incorporating Native American studies into the Round Valley School District. And so uh, some of these pictures you can see include the students uh, and projects that have happened since then. But initially it was in the high school and it's expanded into the elementary school now today. Just very briefly, um, Wailaki is part of sort of a Southern uh, dialect continuum or language continuum, if you will, of California Dene language. Um, and so there's a lot of um, understanding between the different languages. I, I'm coming from Hoopa and in working with Hoopa language from the time I was a child, I was exposed to it. Um, and then coming into this situation where learning about Wailaki through Breath of Life, there was a lot I could understand. And yet there was a lot that needed a lot, you know, more extensive linguistic analysis, but just to kind of place Wailaki in relationship to other languages, it is a part of a larger Dene language family, California Dene. Some language, uh, Hoopa still has speakers, for example, but um, a lot of the other uh, family members uh, uh, do not. There's also Oregon Dene, which I failed to mention, uh, Cheryl also has uh, extended family and, and grandchildren who speak and are fluent speakers of Talawa. So the fact that um, two of us have ex had extensive sort of immersion experience, but also um, practical knowledge in using Dene languages and then also trained linguists, this is um, something that has really helped the project along. And the documentation itself, uh, there is, um, documentation from Pliny Earl Goddard from 1901 to 1906. Um, some of that is at the APS, which we've utilized. Uh, Lee Fung Kui uh, visited Round Valley in 1927 and represents some of the more extensive documentation um, and more precise transcription. There's also Seahart Merriam who worked with a number of speakers in the 1920s. Um, and there are many imprecise transcriptions, translations needing reconstruction in the documentation. And, and from that, uh, our chapter talks about some of those challenges and how we approach them. 
overall, though, uh, we did a lot of online work <laughs> pre pandemic, which I think, you know, at the time we were using Skype and everyone's since moved to Zoom, but we use online tools such as Facebook, Google Sheets, Google Docs, Corpus methods, where these materials are made available um, through Google Sheets and Google Docs to create a searchable database of Wailaki. We used um, historical comparative methods and knowledge of related languages to interpret the materials. And we used the principle of, you know what you know until you know better. And out of this, just a further update is that uh, I did do um, a dissertation in um, which um, Wailaki grammar came out in 2017. So that has been a big help since then having analyzed a lot of the documentation at least that far to be able to know what's happening uniquely in Wailaki as compared to the other languages. And so our chapter, it's broken up into different sections, but one of them is, you know, interpreting attested forms. One of our principles was that even with, at the time, not knowing everything as far as the morphology and grammar, we attempted to maximally morphologically parse words. And so, uh, so an example in the chapter, it will follow you. We would, you know, maximally parse as much as we can and then, you know, revise as needed, uh, both in word, uh, word forms as well as in texts. And then just the challenge is that every single different documenter used a different orthography. <laughs> and so keeping track of those differences across uh, the documentation were important, but also keeping in mind different speakers, different dialects, perhaps, and and yet, um, you know, maybe idiosyncratic features of particular uh, speakers as well. And then just the fact of there being imprecise transcriptions also was a challenge. Um, Goddard, for instance, would give uh, T-O, whether or not we're talking about um, to as water, to as uh, you know, grass or a basket or <laughs> any number of things, we have to keep track of that and, and make sure that we're getting the correct morphemes or even words um, across those transcriptions. And what was a big help, of course, was that um, there's a lot of you know sound correspondences that we can track. And I don't want to go through this extensively, but you know, at least across the California Dene languages, um, Wailaki, Hupa, Matol, Kado, uh, there's a lot of consistency in, in how these sounds are slightly different, but the, the forms um, lend themselves to interpretation. So, sha, hua, ha, sha for sun across those languages, kong, 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 fire, tisbil, tismil for eagle, and then to kind of complement the Goddard example, uh, Oh, tlo, tlo, tlo for grass. <laughs> uh, Wailaki is unique in not using that um, consonant cluster. Uh, gang, wang, gang, one, about it or because. Slok, slok, sloka, slok for salmon, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, there's a lot that's very systematic um, and consistent that helped interpretation. And then uh, the unique challenge of filling gaps in the documentation because it is um, you know, a closed corpus that so we don't have speakers necessarily to work with within Wailaki, though there are Talawa and Hupa speakers um, in which we uh, work with in our various um, you know, groups and in interpreting both those language materials, but I think more recently we've, we've expanded, I'll just say that to um, you know, make use and, and have them help in interpreting Wailaki. At the time, um, looking at the documentation for Hupa, looking at a language that has been allowed to grow, um, you know, into the present day in which we can talk about things like computers, we can talk about things like cars, um, despite, you know, policies of boarding school, et cetera, that there's, you know, Talawa and Hupa that have grown vocabularies since that time. Um, We've looked to Talo and Hoopa for examples on how to grow Wailaki vocabulary for the classroom. And so this is just one example, but uh, in playing card games, how do you talk about the cards? Um, Wailaki, we could talk about hearts, redstones, and arrowheads. But when it came to Bobcat's foot, that was modeled after Hoopa, um, Bose Mechet, cat's foot, Binda Chet, 
bobcat's foot for clubs. <laughs> Uh, for the table, except for example, um, modeled after hoopa miket dahkyan, on it one eats, bucket yang, table, on it one eats. Uh, those are just some quick examples. And then I will just say that um, beyond that time in 2016, uh, we've had in person gatherings, you know, up until the pandemic, uh, whereby we've brought in more people um, interested in, in language. I think that um, there's a lot that has been done um, collaboratively interpreting different word forms across uh, the related languages. This is a picture here of the Live Your Language Alliance gathering in 2018. Um, there's uh, grammar work that um, the students who were originally high school students in 2016 are now uh, you know, professionals and going off to college and, and working in Head Start and, and um, or art school, for example. And then from that, um, keep in touch and, and want to continue their language learning, but also have included more of the um, cultural practitioners, um, Perry, uh, Lincoln, Mike Lincoln, for example, a lot of extensive plant knowledge. Uh, knowledge, place-based knowledge back on the river, for example. Um, and there's more interest in organ DNA collaborations as well, I would say, because there's a number of uh, sleeping organ DNA languages that I think um, folks are interested in how this process has worked for us. So I'll, I'll go ahead and pass it on to Justin and I'll stop share unless you'd like me to keep it on this slide. <laughs> um, yeah, you can either way. Um, thanks, Caleb. Okay. And just in the interest of time, I'll be uh, brief, but um, one of the other things that's been happening lately is uh, Cheryl, um, who is, you know, she's California native, not, but she's not from Round Valley, um, but she is married to somebody from Round Valley who, Frank Tuttle, who's a very accomplished um, uh, artist and um, also works in the school district. Um, so they've recently, uh, with uh, Haley Want, who is a, um, you know, a younger sort of, you know, teacher, emerging teacher, um, they've been uh, working to get the Yuki language, so Round Valley, um, you know, for the historical reasons that I think we always need to be mindful of, um, you know, the reasons that languages are dormant and the um, history of, um, you know, violence that goes along with that. Um, Round Valley, um, through the um, putting together of people speaking different languages uh, in one community, um, there are five different languages uh, that are sort of the main uh, languages of the Round Valley um, uh, uh, tribe. So um, they've been working to get the Yuki language uh, going, or um, they've had a little bit sort of a, a beginning curriculum that they've been doing for a couple of years, but really trying to, to expand um, for another of the languages of Round Valley, which uh, I've been uh, working with Cheryl and Frank um, and Haley, you know, just, uh, you know, start, <laughs> I don't have the background with Yuki that I did, you know, having studied uh, Hoopa and to some extent Wailaki uh, when we were working together, um, you know, uh, starting in 2014. But, uh, uh, you know, we're certainly, we're working through the same kinds of archival materials and grammars uh, with the interesting wrinkle that um, Yuki is, uh, essentially a language isolate, meaning um, it doesn't have linguistic relatives. It's sort of maybe distantly related to one other WAPO, another language of, of Northwestern California. Um, but uh, we don't have that comparative basis to go on. So there are a lot of, you know, we're sort of having to deal with the language on its own terms. Um, and uh, without that, that being able to go out and use sound correspondences or, or you know, use similar vocabulary in a closely related language. Um, the other thing that I've been doing, um, I, and I think this this is something I, I was doing anyway, um, but I've been doing more of it, I think, you know, based on the experience with Wailaki and sort of, you know, the, the questions of recognizing what gaps we were running into um, and how we wished that we had somebody who was a fluent first language speaker of the language um, uh, to, to draw on as a resource um, in interpreting you know, older documents and, and you know, for everything else. Um, so for many years, I've been um, collaborating with Verdina Parker, who is a one of the fluent first language speakers of Hoopa. 
um, and so doing you know linguistic field work that um, in various ways you know tries to I, you know feedback into the revitalization and reclamation work that's going on in Hoopa Valley. Um, but I think you know as a result of the the, the Wailaki, um, the experience that, that I had there, I've been doing a lot more work um, trying to interpret some of those difficult, you know, uh, older materials in ways that they will be, you know, I think more uh, useful and more accessible um, for people moving forward. So um, I just have a very um, quick, uh, let's see. Oh, uh, Kayla, I think you'll have to stop the here. Yeah, thanks. Um, so uh, this is just, and, and this is using um, materials that are archived at the American Philosophical Society. So um, Plenier Earl Goddard's uh, field notebooks. This is for the Quilcut, uh, one of the Redwood Creek dialects of Hoopa. Um, but, uh, you know, he has these collections, uh, you know, amazing stories. But if you notice, um, you've got the, uh, the words on one line and very few, um, words are actually translated. So going through this kind of material and recognizing that, um, you know, for many people at some point having sort of, a, you know, something like a translation and of course more accurate transcriptions um, will hopefully be a useful resource for, for um, learners um, who want to use these materials. So um, I think I'll go ahead and stop there so there's enough time for um, others to speak, but uh, happy to answer questions uh, um, later on. Go ahead, Margaret, you're on screen, so you're, yeah, you're good to go. We had a, a set way uh, that we wanted to go through this. I think, is Carrie here as well? Carrie's not here, so it's just you. Oh, Carrie's not here. I thought that Carrie would be here. Okay, then I will, I guess, represent our group. So the chapter that I was a part of was uh, written by Carrie Miller and uh, Bernie Purley as well. Um, it's nice to see all of you that have gathered today. I would say, you know, I'm really happy to be here. And by way of uh, walking the talk, I often try to introduce myself in the language that I teach and try to encourage my students to use. Our, our article was really about language revitalization and a particular project that we had done and some of the ways it taught us to think about translation theory and how we might practice revitalization. And my understanding was that in celebration of this book coming out, um, you certainly can look at the details of what we did there. It was a lot of fun for us. What we were doing in particular was dealing with a number of languages. Um, my language and the language that I was translating things into was uh, Ojibwe. Often it's uh, coded as Chippewa in the archives, but we would say Don Ojibwe, I speak Ojibwe. And then Bernie Parley, who, who now is at the University of British Columbia, he was dealing with Maliseet, which uh, the Maliseet would call Willistoak. So again, we were working with ethnonyms whenever possible. And um, the Oneida was the other piece that we had, Oneida and Menominee, same thing. We were dealing with languages that in the archives were encoded one way, and what we were trying to do was give them back to those who were revitalizing those languages, engage them in cross-cultural projects of translation, and begin referring to them in the ways that people would have originally. So the Menominee, there's one Menominee nation, it's in the center of Wisconsin, and they uh, would use the language Mamachatao, and then um, the other was Oneida Ongwehoe. So the project that we had was in the chapter, we described how we took a prayer of thanks and translated it into all of those languages. And um, Bernie Purley is an amazing artist and Carrie is an amazing historian. So it was quite the project to see all of this come together and have students experience the prayer in both a visual and um, performative way. People came to a section of, uh, I guess really it was panels of art. I'm, I don't want to repeat what's in the chapter, but if you haven't read that, if you can imagine a prayer 
transformed into uh, human-sized works of art that had translation on them. So students in a nearby school that teaches kindergarten through eighth grade came and experienced the art in these multiple languages and as if they were um, full-sized and in comparison with one another. They got to come and read the language they studied, the languages that their peers study, and really think through the idea of thanks across multiple cultures and through uh, visual representation. So the other uh, piece that I think we were asked to speak briefly about today was what have we been doing now? And if I, I think I can share my screen. I apologize for not having a PowerPoint. We are all learning to live and teach in different ways. And I just came from teaching my face-to-face -face class, both online and in person. And um, I think the easiest way for me is to uh, walk you through a few things that I have on my screen. So I will do that. Um, and I'm going to begin with this website that I have curated for a while with a number of people. Carrie has been part of it. And there has been work on this website that also represents work Bernie and I have done together. Many, many people have contributed to this website, um, Ojibwe.net. We also now have uh, a Instagram site, Ojibwe underscore net, because many of the young people that were learning the language and working with us said, one of the things you need to do to move forward is put this in a, never, a different space. Um, it is perhaps ironic to say that today, as the people in charge of the metaverse are having to answer to Congress for how we curate and archive our images in society. And um, that is a discussion for another day, but I think that it's important to realize that our indigenous languages and language revitalization uh, is connected to all of this. For young people to be fully engaged, they want to see languages in all of these platforms and they want to see a range of activities. Our chapter first and foremost was about taking action in the context of history. And so um, what we did at the, you know, the original project we describe in there has become many other things. I will show you some of the recent projects that we've done here. Um, one of the things that we did was translate the little prince. If we go down here, you can see we translated Ogimants, um, the classic story that has been translated into uh, many, many, many world languages. But we were um, made aware by the publisher, uh, Edition Tintefas, uh, through some translation folks we work with in Germany, that there was not a North American indigenous language that had taken up the task of translating this. And it was fascinating. We worked with students mostly at the university level to translate the book. And we have created a little page here on the Ojibwe.net site for anybody that's really interested in um, more of the details or some of the quotes. These type of projects where you start translating a book that is entirely outside of the culture um, teach new things as well. So really trying to think about the classic language learning texts and could our languages be among those. Um, it was amazing. You know, you think about some of the stories in that book and they resonate with some of our Debajmoanen and Adizilkanak, but then also some of the things discussed in that book are very concerned with modernity and industrialism. And so finding ways to speak of those in our language was also interesting. The other thing that we've done is continued to publish a number of children's books. So this is one that has come out just in the last year, Baby Khan Asia Webswan on Nimki, which is a book that in some cunning ways, uh, working with teachers, we've encoded a lot of things about the seasons and a lot of things about numbers, the things that are um, high frequency concepts in the kindergarten through third grade classroom, uh, but giving kids and families a book that they can begin to use at home because for our languages, even though we can dig into the archives and find many things to help us understand our grammar, our biggest challenge is getting the language back into homes and having them used across two generations. So for us, ironically, the classrooms took our languages away when people were forced to speak only English in school settings. And now in the challenge is actually to get the languages outside of the classrooms. Um, we need to actually do something where we can encourage families to use the language beyond just the setting where the child might learn it and make, a, in many cases, a child comfortable becoming the teacher for their family. Um, and then the other things that I kind of had set here to share with you 
Um, I myself had had to expand working in Wisconsin, if you know uh, our map over here. So Milwaukee, Milwaukee is just north of Chicago and um, we have the intersection of a number of language groups. So we have at the small school, the Oneida, um, Ojibwe, Menominee, Potawatomi, and Ho-Chunk languages. So I have worked to be able to teach the Potawatomi and Menominee and Oneida at the university level. And as part of that, many of my students have taken up projects where they're creating things now used in curriculum in the school. So this is an example of the classic Eric Carl text, brown bear, brown bear, but in Menominee. We've had it for a while in Oneida and Ojibwe, but using these um, already published tools and taking them sometimes from, I guess, more, much more recent archives of revitalization curriculum, and then transforming them into some of the other languages that are also still being learned has been for us a goal to take things that other language teachers have successfully done and move them into languages where they need even more support. There's only one Menominee Nation, there are 142 uh, Ojibwe nations. So that's been part of what we've tried to do now that we feel our language is slightly, slightly more stable. Um, the other example related to this is uh, another little book that came out um, about an otter written by some youth who at a language conference envisioned a book that would teach not just the language, but a sense of resiliency. So they had learned in science that otters hold hands to stay connected, that otters sometimes toss stones to calm themselves down. And so some young people got together and wrote a book which in, was all in the language, which of course was what we wanted because if for a long time we just wanted materials in our language. But this one also has a song embedded in it that's really about well-being and resilience. So now we're moving to creating things that not only just show the language and act as a, a means of translation and instruction, but actually encode some of the ideas of holistic well-being that we've got. Um, I can maybe stop there. I'm happy to take questions or share more about our project or current projects, but maybe I will stop there and, and turn it over. Great. Thanks so much, Margaret, and to Kayla and Justin, uh, and to all of you for, for joining us. I actually see many of the people who presented at the conference uh, in our virtual audience, so great to have you with us virtually. Um, I guess we'll turn it over to questions now. So we have a couple in the, in the q and I I don't know, Brian, if there's one that jumps out to you that you want to get started with. Uh, sure. Um, this maybe uh, there's a couple that come to mind in relation to um, Justin and Kayla's um, presentation, especially, and it's um, this is probably something that is, that Cheryl would especially be um, uh, great at, at answering, but uh, you can probably both uh, uh, address it as well. And the question is about uh, uh, doing revitalization work in sort of the, the teaching audience. Um, and the question is: Is it easier or more difficult uh, to start a revitalization project in terms of the teaching? component um, with beginning with high school students or doing it with younger students. And um, uh, I'm wondering if this is, if some of the, uh, the many other um, uh, language uh, revitalization programs in, especially in Northern California have sort of uh, influenced uh, that approach for Wailaki. I could speak to that a bit. I think that, um... It Dep depends on what your definition of easier is, because I think the younger you go, the more um, the, the young people absorb it and just kind of make it a part of their being. And <laughs> uh, there's a lot that I think, um, you know, I can think of projects happening in Hoopa where they're working with preschoolers and, and kindergartners and first, second graders. Um, I'm thinking of Sarah. Uh, Chase Merrick's work where the a lot is just easily retained and, and speaking ability, you know, all this, the production of that and all that is, you know, you can define that as easy with younger students. But I think the nice thing about working with high school students is that um, they uh, matriculate, graduate and go on and then become the teachers themselves that can go back and feed, you know, like the Head Start or the uh, linguistics program or <laughs> more linguistic, uh, you know, with training. I have a student, uh, Shobi, uh, 
who has been working as a research assistant to me in the Native American Studies program and then uh, at Humboldt State. And so uh, she came in as a freshman and um, I have really enjoyed working with her. I, and I'm sure um, other folks have had those types of experiences where uh, the high schoolers then turn around and, and um, help their community in, in many ways and, be, and become language experts. And so that's something to think about too. Um, def definition of easier and also timeline. I don't know if Justin or, or Margaret, if you want to jump in on this. Well, I would totally agree with all of that. I mean, it's definitely the case that the young ones really do soak it up and can model just moving it into their lives really quickly. We'll use it with each other pretty fast, start little conversations. They'll tend to invent their own phrases and words sometimes as well. But the older students become teachers and, and carry it forward. So a lot of times I have like I, the, some of the examples I gave you of the books that I shared where older students had a, guy, a goal in mind and wanted to create something for younger students. Um, I'm sure even me translating The Little Prince was me wanting to see that, thinking back to my own years of learning French, right? So we all often look back and do something for the child that we were. So I think it's nice to see multiple generations involved in revitalization. So maybe I'll follow this up. I, I like this question here from an attendee who's, it's a, a question specifically for Margaret, but I think uh, Kayla and Justin, you might be interested in answering as well about uh, the, the multiple platforms um, that you're using to, to share uh, languages and, and, and uh, you know, kind of do language revitalization work and, and talking about the different ways that this can be done on a continuum level. But I'm also thinking about the different spaces that, you know, Margaret, you just rushed here from class. And I know that the, the, the chapter that you contributed to the volume was so much about um, interacting and, and having kind of an emotional reaction uh, to, to being in that space and interacting with that art. So, so Kayla and Justin as well, what are the different strategies that you employ as, as you're, you're thinking about the ways to share languages uh, with the different audiences that work with you, that you work with? How do you do this on, on, on kind of a daily level? I guess I can, um, since I haven't <laughs> responded to a question, I can, I can talk about that a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's hard to um, come up with something that's a, you know, one size fits all, um, something for everyone. But um, I think fundamentally what I try to keep in mind is that there are um, the people who are, you know, have whether, you know, the, the time and the inclination and, you know, sort of the, the um, are, are already language nerds, if you will, um, whether or not they're trained in linguistics, but to sort of think about the, um, the audiences, and I'm thinking here of, of people um, like Cheryl, um, but, you know, the, the teachers in, in Hoopa Valley, <laughs> one of whom is closely related to Kayla, um, you know, that, that I, I really draw inspiration from in thinking about the people who have been doing this work for um, many, many years and are um, experts on the language and are asking these, you know, questions that I as linguists don't know how to answer because they're the advanced um, so thinking about preparing materials that will satisfy that audience, um, but then also kind of, you know, the distillation of things that might be for new learners who aren't quite at that point of wanting to see the raw archival documents and, uh, you know, interpret new orthography. So I think it's, you know, having sort of the, um, you know, one space where people can, can interact with, you know, sort of all the messy details and another space that's much more curated um, and, you know, where things have been sort of presented in a, in a standard orthography and, and um, uh, there's sort of less uh, um, of the complexity uh, presented up front. Now, people who then start asking those questions of, but wait, that's, you know, that's not the way my grandmother said it, or, you know, start asking, you know, those relevant questions, then making sure that they can sort of transition into those um, uh, more, uh, you know, I guess, research-based kinds of things. But but I, th I think really it's, um, uh, you know, understanding that, uh, the, 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 these lines between, you know, sort of like, you know, academically trained linguists and um, community-based researchers. So somebody like, you know, Kayla, I think is, is a wonderful example of somebody who does all, who does all of these things, right? Um, so uh, thinking about the, the teachers who are doing a lot of the, the really hard work on the ground as, as having, um, you know, that they're at that point of wanting those, those same kinds of um, things that, that I'm also very interested in. 
If I were going to just add a little bit to that, I would just say um, part of it is looking for where the language and the people are healthy. So it's not as much about the technology or the platform. Um, it's more where are the people who are learning and using the language. So it could be that, you know, little TikTok videos are the things that some kids might be interested in making. Others are interested. My own slightly older daughters in their 20s now were interested in posting longer sentences with photos on Instagram just because that's the platform they were in. But all of it is about where people feel healthy and can be happy using their language. So I think we'll find the platforms and the the venues change. Um, I was recently a part of a very large uh, global project that happened online. Um, the people revitalizing uh, Irish over in Ireland had started a school, Scarcha, a hedge school that was very global in nature. And everyone commented that this wouldn't have occurred before the pandemic. And I think that post pandemic disruption of the idea of a classroom or the idea of an archive and how you access and store knowledge it is maybe good for all of us, right? So um, that's what I try to look for, the spaces where people are healthiest and bring the language to them there. And then I'll just add that I think as knowledge of the language increases um, at the community level, there people are very hungry to see the language across different platforms has been mentioned. Um, there's examples of folks um, sort of reclaiming, renaming spaces, using traditional place names, um, whether in you know, uh, whether that territory is on reservation or not. Um, I, I'm aware of work right happening right now with um, Perry Lincoln as far as reclaiming plant names and, and community gardens. Um, also, some of the programs that you know are grant funded, they, they're uh, naming. Uh, those programs or spaces in in Wailaki. Uh, and so it's proliferating in all these different places. And then, of course, like as mentioned, online Facebook, you know, the students creating their own content and sharing it with community I mean, in their families. And then just this concept of reclaiming spaces, I think it can be really expansive and could be relationships. The fact that um, someone uh, like Shobi refers to her nieces and nephews or aunties and uncles in the language every day um, that that's very um, sort of not, not not visual, but you know, very daily, and and um, seeing that is really great. Well, I've got uh, we've got a number of great questions in the Q and A. We won't be able to get to every single one. We'll do our best. Um, one uh, touches upon an interesting issue that's especially the case with Wailaki, in which Kayla mentioned a bit in the presentation, but it also is addressed more in the um, in, in the uh, book chapter as well, is um, this issue of um, teaching Wailakis in, in parallel with uh, the teachers themselves learning it and uh, developing more knowledge of uh, the workings of it as well, um, and doing that in, in parallel. And so one attendee asked if, Kayla, if you could explain more about, I, I forget exactly where you said it, but you said something to which effective. Uh, you know what you know until you know better. Uh, could you sit, uh, elaborate a bit more on, on that? I probably should have cited Daryl Baldwin and his work with Miami, uh, Miami <laughs> the Miami Center. Um, and I believe that's where maybe I've heard it in the, in uh, however it was phrased. But the idea that as you're working from archival documents, you only know so much. And then later on, you might gain more knowledge that maybe the way you constructed a sentence or constructed a word um, as a strategy, there's a better way, or even that, you know, um, perhaps there was an error at some point. <laughs> so you know what you know until you know better and you do the best you can is sort of um, coming from a lot of different um, people's strategies that I've heard over the years, but uh, including Daryl Baldwin, in, in talking about um, the daily use of the language and then expanding your knowledge and then realizing, oh, there might've been a better way to say that. <laughs> and if I can just add, I think the way Cheryl put it for her classes uh, with her students, and, and this is, I think is an important point, but she would tell her students, it is until it isn't. Um, and I think that the important point there is, um, you know, maybe there are some details that need to be retaught, but um, 
having students understand that this isn't just like, you know, something where you're going to be handed all the answers. And part of the pedagogy then I think is, um, you know, having student high school students um, having these conversations or, or engaging in this dialogue about the nature of what gets taught in schools and how there is this process of interpretation and what does that look like and, you know, having them, um, you know, understand what that looks like in practice and that there are sort of um, things that they can be learning, even if, you know, maybe, you know, that pronunciation or that vocabulary item. But I, I think the fundamental point of, you know, waiting to do this work until you have the perfect understanding of all aspects of the language um, is, uh, you know, you, you can wait forever um, and, and not quite be there, right? We're still, linguists still work on English, which is, has lots and lots of stuff um, written about it. So if we were waiting for the purpose, perfect understanding of English to teach English, English wouldn't be taught. Um, and I think the same point applies to Native American languages is, you know, sort of waiting for, um, you know, uh, you know, it, if tomorrow never comes, then, then that's, uh, you know, sort of a, maybe not the most I know, productive um, stance to take. So I think an example of that would be like where to put stress in the word until I was really able to analyze the full corpus, you know, where's the stress in the word, if, if it's a word uh, not recorded with stress, you know, figuring out those patterns or even um, uh, just some of the uh, imprecise transcriptions where we realize this is actually what's happening, then we cr uh, correct as we get more knowledge. <laughs> Those are more, I think, uh, examples. Hi, Carrie, it's great to see you. Thanks for uh, making time. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry about the confusion over time zones. All good, so you're here. You're here for the for the final question, I think, which is is, is maybe the, the culmination of this whole discussion. So so happy to have you weigh in. So uh, we, we've been talking a lot, obviously, about um, different strategies and, and, and stakes involved with, with language and cultural revitalization, but we haven't talked a lot about the role of archives in this, um, which is, you know, as, as this book says, you know, it's it's indigenous languages and, and the promise of the archives. So, so maybe I'll invite Brian to respond to this question as well. So, so how have archives uh, facilitated the work that all of you uh, have done? You, you know, Justin and, and Kayla, you both brought up examples that from your time at APS. Um, are, are there, are, are there um, things specifically that the archives have done to, to facilitate your research? And then how have you sort of overcome um, the, the really violent legacies and histories that, that, that archives um, really kind of represent. So would love to hear you talk a little bit more about how you, you reckon with those histories uh, while also kind of conceiving these repositories as potential resources for your work. Um, so maybe Carrie would love to hear from you since we haven't yet already, if, if you have anything you'd like to share. Yeah, I, I do actually. Um, so uh, since we we created the, uh, the uh, chapter, I've moved to Canada. And um, one of the, the local archival resources here, the Manitoba Museum, has a lot of uh, in the language recorded um, stories that, that go back to elders recorded in the 70s. Um, and they include discussions of Treaty One. Uh, Treaty One was signed here in the early 1870s. So, you know, that's only a hundred years later. So the, the amount of knowledge that's retained. And uh, I was, I'm actually today in a, a strategic planning event around indigenous language in the province. And uh, one of the other uh, community speakers here talked about when those tapes were brought back to their community and a family came forward when the tape started and said, that's our mother and we haven't heard her voice in 20 years. And, and so there are so many aspects, not just in terms of there's more language in our archival resources than any of us realize, um, you know, from materials that are from the day, um, you know, uh, from, you know, weird missionary textbooks written in indigenous languages in the 1830s to, um, actual discussions at treaty that are written down in language um, to fur traders, you know, literally creating their own sort of dictionary so that they can communicate with the folks that come into their, their trade posts. These are all things that I've found in archives to the kind of very rich, um, you know, recordings and, and, and the kinds of connections that people can make with it. 
So I, I think there's so much more there than people realize. And, and I really hope um, that we'll see more use uh, of the archival materials at places like APS, Newberry Library, and our various museums, um, because it's very rich. Um, it supports community work as well as university work. And, and it's a huge untapped resource. So that's what I got for you. <laughs> You know, I would just add one little thing too, is we have a similar database that we had worked with that was created in the 70s and it had some restrictions on it and those remain in place. So tribes can feel that the material there would not be used without their knowledge. Scholars are able to come and see what's held in that archive. And then there is an agreement with the library to work with the Great Lakes Intertribal Council to give approval for scholars. And we recently did that, went through the process of that entity at the tribal level, approving a scholar who was non-native to access those records. And then further, what we did was create a new archive so that some of the books and things that we're producing now will be saved with audio for the future. So when these newer things are being created and edited and we're working with people to kind of polish those up and have them represent the state we're at in revitalization for these languages right now, there will be an archive going forward. It has some restrictions as well, but not as many. Mostly it has um, required knowledge that uh, scholars are asked to consider before encountering the items rather than feeling that they need to seek any additional approval. So that's another thing is, you know, I think new archives are being created different ways. Yeah, I, I think that kind of data sovereignty is really important that you're talking about. Um, it's a huge discussion up here in Canada, particularly at the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, where they're trying to, to create servers where digital data will be stored that you have to get the password from the First Nation in order to access. Kayla, Justin, Brian, uh, as we come to a close, any final thoughts on, on the work and, and the opportunities of archives to, to help you with that work? Sure, uh, I would just say that um, Hoopa people, you know, we believe that our items such as um, our baskets, you know, have a life of their own and are spiritually imbued. And that's something as we, you know, create them, we're, we're doing that and I would just, um, have people think about the fact that our language documents, our recordings are not completely, you know, inert or it's a neutral practice to even read them. <laughs> and that um, there's a big responsibility to make sure those items are in contact with community and are used in a responsible way. And so um, just a reminder in that and, and always talking to community about their use. So thank you. I can add just a brief thought since um, um, from the archives perspective in order to make these uh, materials, make sure that um, these materials I'm reminded of so many times were, they were created under often conditions of violence and, other, and others, as well as their people who were the sources of the knowledge themselves. In many cases, it's been related to me, the impression that that's, they, they realize that this would be for people in the future. So our job as the, arch the archivist is to make sure that those people's intentions are carried out and, it's, and that energy that they put it into it and using this vessel to carry it in the future reaches the people who, who need it now. And so that, that connection is made and our job is to find things that are getting in the way of that, such as, uh, ways of describing it that don't make sense or new ways that do make sense in terms of people, questions that people are bringing to us in terms of I'm looking for this kind of thing. And um, that's both for representing things correctly, also for a general audience who understands that, that these people, that these speakers are the sources of the knowledge, this is the right way to describe what it is, as well as for um, ensuring that um, it, it's found and that people can utilize it for those purposes. Um, uh, that it's uh, intended for. And uh, anything we can do on, in, as non-native archivists and institutions to both facilitate and get out of the way of that is, um, is the sort of overall idea, I would say. 
So I think, unfortunately, we have run out of time, but as this conversation and, and the volume suggests, um, these conversations aren't going anywhere. Uh, I think that we'll be in conversation for a long time about the best ways to continue doing this work. Um, so I wanna thank you all again for, for making time during what I know is a busy time of, of the year for, for everyone uh, to join us uh, virtually through Zoom uh, to, to talk about this really wonderful volume. Uh, we've, short, we've shared the information about the volume again in the chat. If you haven't already, uh, please uh, check it out. We worked really hard to, to get this volume out there into the world and uh, to share this knowledge. So um, thank you everyone again. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all in um, 2022.